The New York football giants are all eyes on the Minnesota Vikings, but also the waiver wire. We break down the signing of yet another wide receiver, what it means for the way the giants are preparing for this playoff run. And frankly, whether or not giants fans and the NFL at large are disrespecting those Minnesota Vikings. It's all coming up next. Ah, uh, yes, my friend. It's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where we are your hosts over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. And there's no way that we couldn't be healthy, wealthy, and wise ahead of the playoff run. We're doing this nice and early. Appreciate it, Adam. I got to, you know, believe it or not, I also have another job. You know, Adam does the Locked On Nets, but I got to go into work early today. So, Adam, appreciate you sticking it out early with me. But we are talking Giants playoff football today, aren't we? You better believe it, man. And in talking Giants playoff football, we're going to look at this matchup with the Minnesota Vikings, obviously, and try to get, it said at the top there, a, a beat on why this team, maybe unlike other teams, 13 wins, 13 wins, and it feels like there is some universal acceptance that they are not that good of a team. And there's an, so a couple interesting questions to ask around that, but What's um, maybe not interesting, because this has become kind of standard practice for Joe Shane and the Giants, is scouring that waiver wire, Andy. Are you at all surprised, though, that Joe Shane and the Giants did, it looks like, at least reported by Art Stapleton and others, that the Giants, after having a few different wide receivers in for some workouts yesterday, are going to be signing former Cowboys wide receiver James Johnson to the practice squad. Um, do you read into this as anything more than Joe Shane being proactive, trying to think ahead. I'm sure there's off-season value to getting guys in the building now as opposed to waiting. Or is this looking at the Giants wide receiver room and saying it never hurts, never hurts to have a couple extra bodies? Well, look, you know, James Washington is 26 years old. He was a second-round draft pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers. He has 11 touchdown catches in his career. He's played in big football games before. And I think that's one thing that the Giants do need is experience as they try to go on a little bit of a run here in the playoffs. And they caught Adam, 24 passes for 285 last season of 12 yards per catch and two touchdowns for Steelers. Right. And, and he also broke his, he was with the Dallas Cowboys earlier in the season. He broke his foot in training camp. He was supposed to be a complimentary wide receiver. Number three in that Dallas Cowboy room of CD lamb, Michael Gallup and James Washington, unfortunately got hurt. You know, things things kind of went a little bit awry. And then, you know, when all, in all that waiting, the Dallas Cowboys decided to sign T.Y. Hilton. They flirted with Odell Beckham and ultimately released James Washington. Um, you know, I, I just think it's a veteran depth piece. You never know if one or two guys goes down on the roster. Like, you may have to pull somebody up that could step in and catch four or five balls. I don't think we're in the developmental stage of, like, have a guy on our practice squad. Let's, like, see what happens. It's like... If I need you to catch two passes in like a big situation, can you do it? James Washington has proven that he at least can do that and has done it for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, I feel comfortable essentially labeling it, you know, labeling it that way and seeing what happens here. By the way, I, I was trying to track down, and I don't know if you have the top of your head whether or not he was involved in the return game in Pittsburgh in his career. Because the other thing I was just thinking about, it's like it's the this season, next season kind of thing of having some bodies back there. We know Richie James has been here, whether or not he'll return, et cetera. Like sometimes I think about it too, in the, in the sense of it's not just the primary position. It's also the secondary thing, something that Joe Shane, Brian Dable, all the coaches have put a big emphasis on uh, over the course of this year, needing guys in specific roles, right? Yeah, of course we've seen it all year. There, these secondary players for this team, whether it's a Richie James stepping up, whether it's Isaiah Hodgins now who has emerged, whether it's Darius Slayton, who is buried as fifth or sixth on the depth chart, the, the New York Giants have shown that they need these complimentary pieces. I mean, you know, Nick, Nick Vanette and Chris Myrick and Lawrence Cager and other guys, names yeah, that like yeah. you wouldn't fathom would be on the Giants contributing, have all contributed this year. I would not be surprised when you're talking about the fringe there, Marcus Johnson or James Washington in a critical situation. You just never know when you'll need them. I'm totally fine with it. 
Yeah, I think experience matters. Obviously, we know I, I was I was always pulling pulling at the heartstrings of the Giants to get Khalil Pimpleton a look, but that's a rookie wide receiver, right? Like that that's someone who doesn't have at least any track record in the NFL to look at and say, hey, in spite of a foot injury earlier this year, it's good to have more quality there. We won't belabor the point. Obviously, there's a good chance you never hear or see James Washington over the course of this postseason, but the Giants have shown the willingness to go deep into the depth chart in order to find ways to win. And in finding ways to win and turning our attention to the Minnesota Vikings, you, know, you said this, we were talking about in our pre-show, how do we want to approach this next couple of episodes? Obviously, there's a lot of matchup stuff we're going to do, but it did seem, to your point, worth just taking that step back for a second and reminding everybody that this is a, you know, this is a team in the Minnesota Vikings who, what, like, I'm like, I'm like pulling up their schedule actively here. So they lost to the Eagles. I got to go all the way back to the Cowboys and then the Lions. And then the Packers, right? There's four losses on their resume. They're a 13-win team. You think about the teams that they lost to. Two of them are in our division. Two, those two teams are in the playoffs, right? They played. We played them tough, lost by three points. The Lions, who had a very good season for themselves. Why is a team that has played in a ton of one-possession games and won those games being talked about in a way as if, like, I don't know. They're being talked about like they're Tampa Bay who snuck into the playoffs here in the NFC and have a under 500 record. Like it's, it, it is interesting. And I, I want to get your take on it because I have a, I have a very clear perspective on this when it comes to being a giants fan in the way that they've played this year. Okay. So I'm going to go on a full 360 here. So here stay with me on this. The Minnesota Vikings are 13 and four because they find ways to win in critical situations. They are 11 and 0 this season in one score games. When the when the chips are on the table in the fourth quarter, they have found ways to execute. Kirk Cousins has always been, you know, laughed at and maybe we'll talk about him in a minute, but you got to give credit where credit's due. They are finding ways to win. The problem, Adam, is when they lose, they get absolutely destroyed by teams. They did. They can't come back. They mail it in. They they just cannot figure out a way to stay competitive in those games that they lose. And the reason why Minnesota kind of gets this bad connotation around the league and everyone says, oh, they're frauds, this and that, is because the Minnesota Vikings are 13 and four and they have a negative, negative three point differential this year. Yeah. That means they're 13 and four and their opponents have scored more points than them. And I'll give you this one stat that just is telling you may say, what does that mean? Who cares? They're winning football games, Andy. There is a team in the NFC in the San Francisco 49ers that is also 13 and four. If you had to guess what their point differential is, what is it, Adam? Just throw a number out there. 180. Yeah, it's 173. So when you think about it, they're 176 points more, which is which is over 10 points a game better than what the Minnesota Vikings are. It's why a lot of people like myself and probably yourself, Adam, wanted to play the Minnesota Vikings as opposed to going to San Francisco because you can see how explosive San Francisco is on both sides of the ball just by that point differential alone. Oh, of course. And, and I, 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 I've been around some of these numbers recently. So uh, you sneak, you sneak. There, was, there was some, there was something informing me there a little bit, but here's what I find is I find fascinating. Right. And I, and it, and it makes sense, right? This is why, again, the giants are kind of in the same boat. And then you look at the giants record and you say, well, that's a little bit more reflective of being in some games, couple of blots, et cetera. And we even mentioned how, well, you take the one blowout they had and on losing and losing and winning. And all of a sudden you get back kind of to neutral. The interesting thing to me is, though, like this is just a fun little fact. If you're a team that plays like one possession games, like, say, the Houston Texans, who were in a lot of those this year and ended up finishing, as we know, with the second overall pick because they blew it on, on Sunday, getting themselves a win. Um, if you lose every game by seven points, you, that means you're in every single game. You come out at the end of the year being a negative 150 plus point team, right? And like we were, I was talking about this with uh, Doug when we were watching the games last weekend and it was like, right, like you can be a very competitive team and just come out on the wrong side and find yourself looking like a total dumpster. And the, and the Houston Texans are one of those teams. Like they played well, they were in close games, but guess what? Talent, you know, certain little key factors, just not being a good enough team is what ends up saying, okay, ultimately the better team is going to get over the top on you. They're going to get that extra possession. You're going to make that extra mistake in that sense. And I'll tie it back to the giants here. It's like, 
Are we are we going to sit here? If you're going to sit here and say 13 and four for the Minnesota Vikings, but a negative point differential, ugh, you really can't trust that they're that dangerous. Okay. The Giants also do not have a great point differential, and they're nine, six, and one. So, what, what does that mean for the Giants then? Then you'd say, right, okay, because we're scrappy, because we don't have all the talent, because we execute, you know, technically as good as we can, even though we've discussed some of their penalty issues, et cetera. Like, that means that we're more dangerous. Like, I, it, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to look at it that way. And I'm not even saying it's a knock the Giants because we're going to talk about the quarterbacks here in a second. But, I think sometimes, and I I am king of this, I love the numbers, I love getting into the weeds on the stats, sometimes it just is, well, did you win the games? Yes, you did. And that makes you a good team, and it makes you a dangerous team. Well, so I have a, a slightly different take on this just from the way that it works in the NFC specifically, Adam. So if I were to say, who are the three, te- if, I, if you could only pick three teams in the NFC, who are the three teams in the NFC that you think have a chance to get to the Super Bowl? Like, uh, the a- Eagles, the 49ers, obviously, and I'm still, I'm probably going to say, and the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, interesting. See, yeah. I, I would go Dallas Cowboys over the Minnesota Vikings just because we've seen what their peak looks like defensively with Michael Parsons yeah, and, and that I, defense, and defense like, in the playoffs. I, I get you there. Yeah. They, they also beat the Minnesota Vikings by 40 points, which added to that differential. But the yeah. reason why I say that is because when you look at it, Adam, the team that has the worst differential is the Bucs. They've been outscored by almost 40 yeah. points this year. The Bucs, the Vikings, and the Giants all have a negative differential. Seattle's at six, so they're just on the other side in the positive direction. But then you look at the Dallas Cowboys, San Francisco 49ers, and Philadelphia mm-hmm. Eagles yeah. all have 125, 130 points four in the plus category. And that's why when you think about like over the course of the season – which team is separating themselves more frequently, more often. It kind of comes out that way where where you're like, we understand why people don't believe in Minnesota, but also that's why it's a tough matchup for the Giants because they're kind of like for like teams and Minnesota has the home game. Oh, hundred percent. Right. And defense matters more, obviously in in the playoffs. It's funny because we're going to talk about quarterbacks. And one of the reasons why I'm not so sure about Dallas is because Dak Prescott, and this is the funny thing, right? It's like, is Kirk Cousins the guy you can trust? That's what we're going to discuss here in a second and tie it into Daniel Jones. But it's like, I don't know. I don't trust Dak Prescott. Frankly, a lot of these wins came when somebody else was the quarterback for their team. Like it just, there are these scenarios where you look over their schedule, but to your point, I mean, you go back and this is a great one-to-one comparison. The giants were in beating Washington 25 to 10. You know, they took care of the Rams as the Cowboys 22 to 10. And there is that big blowout over Minnesota, which is like the direct one-to-one where you feel like, Hey, look how we destroyed you. We can do that again. If it comes to the playoff time. Um, other than that, though, and then they blew out Washington again on the final game of the season. You know, so I think that if you looked over all of these schedules collectively, uh, let's say Eagles, 49ers and Cowboys, I think you would find more often than not that the Cowboys would be the ones where you'd say, well, just take away the Washington games. How, are they as impressive? Right. They're going to be closer to a, a hundred in the point differential. And by the way, this is me not liking the Cowboys and wanting to bring them down to the muck a little bit. But. I mentioned Dak Prescott, and we're talking about also Kirk Cousins and Daniel Jones in this. You asked the question, so go go ahead and pose this question that you came up with before we started here around the QB play, because this is what I think is fascinating on both sides. Yeah, so we know that Kirk Cousins has been good this year, Adam. You know, he's he's top five in passing yards. He's, uh, you know, been pretty solid. He's top 15. He's top half of the league in passer rating this year. Yeah, obviously, Kirk Cousins has had a nice year. He gets a lot of slander. Okay, yeah, great. 29 Daniel up, Jones has down, obviously 4,500 yards. Yes. Yeah, he's tons of passing yards, filling up the stat sheet with Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson. Um, the, the thing I started thinking about in this game and why Giant fans feel so confident is that you look around the league, you look at even in the AFC with Mahomes and Burrow and Josh Allen and, and Justin Herbert, even Lamar Jackson, like you look at all these you know, quarterbacks that when you feel like they get out there, they have a distinct advantage over their opponent. The sure. Giants come into this game against the Vikings and Giant fans are, are, you know, understandably pretty confident that they can compete because we just saw it on the field. And that made me think, you know, Daniel Jones has obviously played significantly better this season than what we have seen in the past to the point where top 10 in QBR has looked great. Knowing that Kirk Cousins has four playoff game you know experiences under his belt and daniel jones has none 
if you were to ask either team if they could make the switch and switch for this game, would either team do it? And if one would, who would it be and why? Yeah, I don't. I don't think either. N- neither team would, right? Giants. Okay, Giants fans would say a hundred percent no, because we all look at Kirk Cousins and say this is a dude that doesn't deserve the money that he got, and he's a you know as good as the team has been. If not for Justin Jefferson, what would his stats look like? And he's always been kind of this ho hum pedestrian kind of quarterback that just doesn't doesn't impress you. He's not a guy that goes and wins games. And by the way, like there's a track record there where like in the big moments he's going to give you some big mistakes. And he doesn't have the strongest arm either. It's all these things, right? But from the Vikings standpoint, you're going to look across the field and talk about a guy. And you mentioned you mentioned all the stats for the uh, for Kirk Cousins with the Vikings. You're going to look across the field and you're going to talk about a guy in Daniel Jones that's thrown for 1,300 less yards this season than Kirk Cousins has, who's thrown for 14 less touchdowns than oh sorry uh yeah 14 less touchdowns than Kirk Cousins has. Now maybe you're going to look and say he's thrown nine less interceptions. And we're such a good team offensively that if he gets to eliminate that, like I think there's a world where going into next year, they would say, Oh, if we're, if the money's equal, I would take Daniel Jones cause he's younger and the upside is better. And I think a lot of Vikings fans have grown weary of Kirk cousins and what his, what his limitations are. But if you're talking about a playoff run, I, I think it's hard to look at a guy like Daniel Jones as, as fond as we have become of him over the course of this season and say, I want him in his first playoff game when I do. My, my, my quarterback has led us to 13-4. and four. It's really hard to knock what the results have been in totality, even if in a microcosm you have your concerns around Cousins. So this is interesting because when you look at Daniel Jones, you, Daniel, you say Daniel Jones isn't as good of a passer, pure passer as Kirk Cousins, right? Like that's kind of where my head initially goes. And when you look at passer rating for this year, they literally have the exact same passer rating at 92.5, well, Adam. No, and here's the thing, because I don't I don't necessarily again, if, if you were asking me, I'd say I, I think that Dan, I think that Daniel Jones is a better overall athlete. He's so many different things. And I think he has the better upside. I would take Daniel Jones nine times out of nine. I don't know why I didn't say ten times out of ten. But the <laughs> different like so when you look at completion percentage, right? Daniel Jones has 67 completion percentage this year. We talked about a little bit the stats yesterday about Kirk Cousins and what he's done in the playoffs. When you look at those numbers, you say Daniel Jones has done a lot of things better than Kirk Cousins this season. However, the difference is, as we know, Kirk Cousins has Jefferson, and that makes it more explosive and more dynamic, and Dalvin Cook and TJ Hawkinson. But it also means that you're, you're throwing you know, riskier throws. You're throwing low percentage, lower percentage success throws over the course of a season, over the course of games. Now, Jefferson's going to make a lot of amazing catches. He's going to be the best wide receiver in the league, and it's going to make you look that much better. But this is always the thing to me about if you went out every game this year with Daniel Jones and said, hey, open it up a bit more. I want five deep passes. I want more risks. Daniel Jones would probably have 20 to 25 touchdowns. He might have closer to 10 interceptions. The percentage might come down a little bit, and I would still feel the same about him. I'd still feel overwhelmingly positive. So I think that's the difference is that stylistically, Daniel Jones – and legs right run the ball daniel jones use those legs the way in which these quarterbacks can have success individually is different and that's that's a big part of it i think if Kirk cousins had the legs that daniel jones does you'd see him throw the ball seven less times a game and run the ball that much more but he doesn't so you have to live with some of the risk reward and some of that hey there's going to be games when it's going to come down to whether or not you make that one pass and jefferson makes the big play and we win that one possession game well, we talk, We just talked about how they have the same exact passer rating at 92.5, yep. so they're relatively similar. Like you said, okay, you know, give Daniel Jones, Justin Jefferson, and TJ Hawkinson, and let's see My how God. he would be able to manufacture points in the, in the passing game. You, you mentioned rushing yards being a big difference. Daniel Jones has over 700. Kirk Cousins doesn't even have 100 rushing yards. And when you look at some of the advanced QB metrics like QBR, that puts Daniel Jones seven. They said he was absolutely yep. efficient. His seven touchdowns rushing was a tremendous boost for his value for the team. When you look at total QBR, Daniel Jones at seventh, Kirk Cousins at 23rd, because yep. he doesn't have that dimension that Daniel Jones allows the Giants to do. And I'll be honest, in a playoff game, when there's pass rushers galore and you need to just make a play, like sometimes being able to scramble with your legs, take that ball down and run with it, 
just using your instincts is going to be the differentiating factor between the two quarterbacks. And by the way, put those rushing yards into it. This is 4,600 all-purpose yards for Kirk Cousins and 4,000 for Daniel Jones. So there, you know, there are ways you look back at this and you say, hey, it's not as far apart as you think. And that's for any comparison you're going to make to Daniel Jones. On top of which, we'll close out on these on this note. Um, one, in, in the playoffs, having a mobile quarterback, I mean, in the NFL in general, but that's a big factor. So Daniel Jones can mitigate what they don't have, and that's been a big part of this season, right? Roll him out, get him into space. If the wide receivers aren't getting open, he can give you a first down with his legs. He can change a drive solely with that. So in terms of matchups, we'll talk about wide receivers specifically uh, tomorrow. But in terms of the fronts, I think this is the best way to think about it with these two QBs. And let's just be very clear here. I would always take Daniel Jones over Kirk Cousins. You and I have talked a ton about how we felt about Kirk Cousins over the years. A couple seasons ago, we did the value versus cost, and Kirk Cousins was near the bottom of that list, and we'll probably have more of those in the offseason. Offensive line, are you more confident in Daniel Jones and the Giants' offensive line and his mobility in totality or – in the Minnesota Vikings, what they have in front of Kirk Cousins, even though he's not a mobile quarterback, but him being able to stay in there and then use all the weapons they have. Do you think that there's a clear cut who has that better advantage in terms of being able to execute based on what they want to do? Oh, absolutely. The Minnesota Vikings have the clear edge in that scenario that you just par parlayed out there, Adam. And, and the reason why is because we talk about those weapons, like, uh, there was a fourth down against the Buffalo Bills for the Minnesota Vikings earlier in the season. The catch of the year. Justin Jefferson amongst the trees goes up with one hand acrobatically and catches the ball. Vikings go on to win the game. The Giants don't really have that X factor on the outside where if things go awry, you can just kind of toss it up and hope for the best. And so for me, having those weapons have the ability to get separation. Look for TJ Hawkinson against our linebacking core as an area where the Vikings are going to look to exploit. To me, having those weapons almost feels like you get an extra second of time if you're Kirk Cousins because you're like, I don't need to wait until they're open. I can I can just kind of throw a 50-50 yeah, ball up, and my team is going to be able to come down with it. Yeah, and listen, you talk about a guy like Darisaw who's playing there for them. Obviously, it's funny. Look at Ezra Cleveland. These are guys that we scouted and talked about in and around draft classes for the Giants. Remember, that Christian Darisaw is going to be lined up. That's the left tackle for them. Now, it really doesn't matter because Wink moves the guys around a lot. But there's some key matchups across that front, including Odu on the right side, right? Ed Ingram at right guard. Questionable for Bradbury right now in the middle of their lineup there. Um, but this is a strong offensive line. And I think, again... This is maybe goes back to that root question at the end of the day. Who would you rather have? Well, I'd rather have most of the Vikings team, and then <laughs> I'd like to have Daniel Jones. So who knows? It'd be fascinating to hear what Vikings fans would respond to on that question because when you look at everything, including that offensive line, you start to say, I think, and maybe Vikings fans know this, right, especially depending on how this game goes, we're just a better quarterback away, right? We're just a better version of Kirk Cousin away from being able to have really deep playoff runs. And I'm sure they're going to have a lot of questions to answer this off season. If when the New York football giants upset them here in the wild card round, uh, Andy closing thoughts before we remind people where to get us. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, I keep going back to this Minnesota Vikings defense. And when you talk about the, the, the least effective grouping unit of any team, maybe it's the Giants' special teams, but outside of that, like when you talk about offense, defense, the Minnesota Vikings defense of those of the four different groupings is clearly the worst of them all. That has to be a feather in the cap for the Giants to say, we have something that we can exploit. We know where you are absolutely weakened. That's where I think when, when we get into the matchups, the Giants are really going to have to take advantage of it in order to come out with a W. Yep. Get us over on YouTube. Get us on the podcast feed. Coming up on the next episode, it's going to be about exactly what Andy said. Justin Z Jefferson, Adam Thielen, the guy that <laughs> it doesn't even matter why talk about him, but he still exists and he's on that roster. TJ Hawkinson, Dalvin Cook, all the weapons. How does the Giants secondary specifically defend against that? Noah Dory Jackson last time, obviously. And then on the Giants side of it, who can step up? Who can be consistent? How do you exploit the weakest part of the Minnesota Vikings defense? And how do you manufacture opportunities for Daniel Jones to say, hey, it's my arm, it's my leg. Either way you slice it, you're going to be dead. Getting a little bit bullish as we head down the stretch here. 
You do all those great things we said. We'll continue to cover this matchup all week long. And as Andrew Makowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.